see me, you Stevie. Wondering how I reach more evolutions than Eevee and make it look easy. What is up, Earth's Mightiest subscribers? It's Blur Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, today's video, I wanted to take a brief moment to talk about the upcoming adjectiveless X-Men by Jed McKay and Ryan Stegman. This book is going to be dropping on, I believe it's July the 10th. So we got a little ways before it gets here. But the thing I wanted to do is because we actually have a little bit more information about it. And while I did do a video talking about the release or not really the release, the reveal of the you know, teams, the rosters for Gail Simone's Uncanny X-Men, as well as Evel Ewing's Exceptional X-Men. We haven't gotten any more information for those books. I'm pretty sure we're gonna get it soon though. This one, uh, we actually got a few days ago. We actually talked about it on the Blur Cave a little bit, but I know not everybody watches it, even though I feel like technically, if you are a fan of this channel, you probably should. It's actually, a really fun thing. We literally just celebrated our 250th episode. So yeah, you should totally be doing that. But anyway, I thought I'd do a separate video just to kind of talk about it here. So that said, to get into this, there are a couple of blurbs we're gonna read. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if you are in any way, shape, form or fashion invested in not being spoiled on the, I don't want to say like the overall ending, but the ultimate fate of Krakoa itself, I'm going to say you might want to cover your ears for a little bit. That said, I'm getting right into it. The fall of Krakoa will go down as one of the darkest chapters in mutant history, but Cyclops refuses to allow the X-Men to be victims. The first X-Man mutant kind's ultimate leader, and arguably the most brilliant strategic mind in the entire Marvel Universe. Scott Summers steps up to guide his species towards a better future in Jed McKay and Ryan Stegman's X-Men. Okay, so first and foremost, let's go ahead and address a couple of elephants in the room. Uh, so that was pretty cool. Jed McKay, or rather the Marvel offices, but I'm pretty sure it was also with the help of Jed McKay, putting a little more respect on Cyclops' name. I know a lot of people will probably be upset about the fact that Captain America wasn't placed uh, you know, in that position as being you know, arguably you know, the most brilliant strategic mind in the Marvel Comics universe, which to be fair, if you would have said, yeah, you know, maybe second to Captain America, I'd have been like, oh, okay, yeah, I rock with that. But the thing I think people don't really think about as much as people love to call Cyclops the Captain America of the X-Men, to the point he was even Captain Krakoa for a brief stint. The whole thing that I think people are kind of missing here is that while, yes, Captain America, hugely intelligent, you know, battlefield tactician, Cyclops isn't a slouch by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, he is largely responsible for a lot of the tactics that were used on a lot of Krakoan response teams. So yeah, this guy kind of knows his shit. So let's not sit here and pretend that Psyche is not that dude. Also, I kind of feel like just based on uh, you know, some of the things that are said in this uh, solicit, this preview, if you will, I feel like we are maybe angling towards the return of right clops. Yeah, y'all know I'm talking about the Cyclops that was right. The same Cyclops that shows how he had some of that dog in him. He was a little gangster with it when it came to fighting for mutant rights. The same Cyclops that literally pinned a letter to the government that basically said, we're the X-Men. We're still going to fight for humanity. We're still going to fight to protect this planet. But make no mistake, if you run up, you most certainly will get done up. Getting back into it, it goes on to say, announced last month, X-Men will be the first of three flagship X titles set in the upcoming From the Ashes era. No longer living under the protection of Krakoa, it's a dangerous time for mutants everywhere. And dangerous times call for radical action. Cyclops gathers a group of his most trusted and reliable mutant soldiers along with the brightest of the next generation to tackle the most prevalent threats to mutant kind, including an existential new enemy that rises out of the remains of Orcus. Prepare for a reckoning as this team 
handles explosive mutant specific issues without restraint. Humanity can hate them all they want as long as they fear them. First things first, the next generation of mutants, it easily points to both the inclusions of characters Kid Omega, as well as the artist formerly known as Oya, but now known as Temper. We will probably not just be getting Temper and Kid Omega as uh, characters in this as the younger crop. Of course, we also have Magic, who is one of the younger mutants on the team as well, but she's kind of the midway point between characters like Cyclops and Beast, and then Temper and Kid Omega. She's like that middle ground. I do feel like we will probably get some other characters who end up joining the team or at least being around the team on some major level, uh, and only if for no other reason, the fact that we know that Gail Simone's Uncanny X-Men has already stated there'll be four new mutant characters created specifically for that series who will be hanging around a lot as well. So it is to reason that we'll probably expect something similar. Maybe not quite as many, maybe not four. But I could definitely see like one or two new characters being added in, or maybe even some older characters added in that have not been announced. It has been largely hinted that the characters we saw on the uh, the big you know, three cover spread, that that's probably not all of them. And when you think about it, there was a lot of dead space in that image, so I'm willing to go with that. Once again, they made sure they put all their white characters front and center first, but yeah, hey. I've noticed Marvel's been doing that a lot lately, so yeah, hey. You know, for all the people who think that I'm a Marvel shill who never criticizes them, you would be wrong. Anyway, moving on. We also cannot overlook the mention of a new enemy rising out of the remains of Orcus. Now, this could just simply mean that there's a new villain on the rise who just so happens to be taking Orcus's place, but the wording is pretty specific. So whoever this is, is someone who was very likely a part of Orcus. I don't know who or what this enemy is going to do or be, but I mean, considering they say it's a new enemy, it's not gonna be anyone we've ever seen before. Or who knows, they might be trying to Arkham Knight us. You never know. If you don't get that reference, well, go Google Arkham Knight reveal. We can't forget that also this is going to be taking place in Alaska. And I know that was kind of one of the biggest criticisms. A lot of people were so hyper worried that, you know, oh, the X-Men are going to be going back to the mansion. Well, no, no one's going back to the mansion because the mansion is not even available. This is something that came up when uh, the trailer was released for all of this. And we saw that there were going to be some other people taking over the mansion it was going to be decommissioned and used as a prison. And that while technically will not be used as a base of operations for the X-Men, there might just be one X-Man who's in there, who's, you know, Prisoner X, uh, so to speak. We don't know who that is yet, but, you know, a lot of the smart money has been on Charles Xavier, which, you know, that could be the case. But yeah, Alaska, the, the more I think about it, Alaska makes a lot of sense because it's isolated, there's more solitude. It would make sense for a group of people who are literally on their ass after losing their home to go there if they just really want to be left the f alone. Another thing you can't overlook either is there's a part here where it says that you know, this is going to be a reckoning as this team handles explosive mutant specific issues without restraint. Well, we gotta remember the rules and laws of Krakoa no longer exist. So the whole kill no man rule, that's out the window. Something tells me we will actually be seeing an X-Men team, at least not saying across all books, but in this one, most specifically, especially considering that Psylocke is on the team. And this is not the Betsy Braddock version. This is the Kanan version. And yeah, she is perfectly okay with killing. And so too is Magic. So you have some people on the team who are more than willing to catch a body. You also bring Juggernaut into the mix and that just adds a, a whole other level to this. But yeah, but also having Juggernaut on the team, a character who is not subtle by any stretch of the imagination, it makes sense that you would you have a team, you'd be fielding a team that is more meant for direct attacks and you know, maybe actual warfare and combat, not trying to de-escalate situations with flowery words or anything of that nature. So I think this makes a lot of sense. And I'm really excited for this because I like it when Cyclops is in gangster mode. It just, it just, it's always better for everybody when Cyclops just doesn't give a f That is the best version of Cyclops to me uh, at all times. Yeah, a Cyclops who leads the team and tries to make the best calls, but also a Cyclops that recognizes that, well, yes, he does want peace between humans and mutants. He's not just gonna let humans walk all over him. 
And I like that. Also the whole line about how humanity can hate them all they want so long as they fear them. I, I love that. That is, that's chef's kiss. Yeah, this is definitely white radical Cyclops. This is right Clops. This is Cyclops was right Cyclops. And I'm here for it. Now the real story with this uh, adjectiveless X-Men series that I feel like no one's talking about. I feel like even the people who are hating on the fact that Krakoa is ending and just don't even want to give a new X-Men series a chance. I feel like all these people, the thing that they're missing and where I feel that this is going to be the best opportunity for storytelling, because you know, once again, you always have to remind these folks that, you know, well, yes, maybe your favorite thing is going away, but that doesn't mean that you, know, this can't work. And I'm willing to give it a chance because, you know, I want to go back to something I said in my first video for House of X. Uh, you know, the thing that it reminded me of reading House of X, the thing that popped in my head was Black Wall Street. And that is because back in the 20s, granted, you know, maybe the talking points were there, but maybe not in the exact same way. But a lot of the things that you hear white conservatives say today was very much true then. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, build your own place, make your own way. That is the American dream you should be striving for, not waiting for handouts. And then black people actually took the initiative to create their own place, what was affectionately called Black Wall Street in Tulsa. And what happened when that was created? White people got angry and then raised Black Wall Street to the ground, butchered every man, woman, and child they could get their hands on. That's kind of what Orcus has been doing to Krakoa. It's the same thing. It's a, it's a commentary I feel was, and, and you could even take Black Wall Street out of the occasion. You could bring up Rosewood. You could bring up Wilmington. You could even bring up all the various indigenous settlements that white colonizers have raised to the ground. We can even, you know, look back to the Killers of the Flower Moon film that uh, Scorsese put out just towards the tail end of last year. The movie that was about the massacre of the Osage indigenous tribe. You could use any of that as an example. And it's always in a case where one group of people who is considered less than has something that white people want and they are willing to ask for it. And more importantly, if they do ask for it and they are denied, they will suddenly just decide, well, fine, we'll just take it. That is the American way. Well, that's what happened to the X-Men. Krakoa was their Black Wall Street, their Osage Nation, their Wilmington, their Rosewood, Seneca Village, if you will. And Orcus came along and tried to take it. Not even just take it, just get rid of it. And I feel like that's where the opportunity for the best storytelling is because now you're looking at people who have lost their home, they've been displaced. Where do they go? Are they gonna go back to the Australian outback? I mean, they could, but they're not gonna do that, especially after all the Sentinels just rained down in the outback in the uh, Invincible Iron Man series uh, as of recent. So no, they're not gonna do that. They're going to places like Louisiana. They're going to Alaska, you know? They're going to Chicago. Yeah, and it's interesting because you know, this is gonna be a story, and this is gonna be the same for every X comic coming out in the post Krakoa era, is that there are gonna be mutants trying to find their place in the world. And that is a daunting thing, especially in a situation where you consider you had a home. I would even implore people to think of it this way. And I actually use this analogy on the Blur Cave, uh, episode number 250. It's basically this, imagine that you had a roommate. You lived in an apartment with a roommate. The apartment was okay, and you know, the rent was half-ass decent, maybe, maybe a little high, and it was in an okay-ish neighborhood, but the problem is that your roommate is racist. Like, wishes you would go back to where you came from racist. Now, imagine you finally, you just have a glow up. You come up on some money, and you Find yourself a new place. You actually move out of that apartment. You go find yourself a nice place, nice condo somewhere. Maybe even a house in the suburbs, really nice place, whatever the case may be. And you're just doing infinitely better. You got a new car, you got a nice new car. You, you got nice newer clothes. You're living good, you're eating good, you're looking better. You're just doing overall great. And that roommate that you had living in that apartment, guess what? They're struggling now because now they can't pay the rent because you're gone. And you know what? 
They're kind of mad at you for it. They didn't really want you there, but you were paying rent and now you're gone. Now they got to find somebody else to come in and pay the rent. And now they're just mad at you because you came up. So not only were they never able to kick you out, but you left of your own volition. And now you're doing better than them. So imagine they just say, you know what? Hey, we're going to go to your new place, burn the down. And now suddenly you got to go find a new place to live. Not necessarily saying you have to go back to your old apartment, but let's say you have to move back into the same building. It's gonna be weird. And I feel like that's a great opportunity for storytelling that I think a lot of people aren't thinking about. And it's it's something I feel like, and I have a video actually coming out about this. It's, it's once again, it always comes back down to media literacy. It's like, just because something bad happens in a story that you are consuming, doesn't mean that you have to like it. A lot of times bad things happen to tell a story. And if you, don't have conflict in a story, you have no story. That's why people love X-Men comics. I mean, yeah, sure, a lot of people try and claim that, oh, they're so tired of the X-Men getting crapped on, but here's the thing, that's probably why you like them, because they are being crapped on. That's half the appeal. Yeah, sure, it sucks when you see the good guys lose, but if they were winning all the time, would you really be enjoying their comics? I don't think you would. I think you would call them boring. And now guys, I know I'm saying you a lot. I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about the collective internet, you. <laughs> If that makes any sense. This is a story I feel like any marginalized community can put their head behind because you, you know, fill in the blank, you, you survived the evils of the world. And now the place you call paradise is gone. Now you gotta come back with your hat in your hand and try and figure out how the hell you are gonna try and make some kind of a place in the world. This has the potential to be something really special. And while, yeah, it's going back to status quo, you know, quotey finger status quo, they had to lose at some point. You can't just sit on the mountaintop forever. I'm sorry, it's just not a viable status quo. But anyway, that's just my take on it. And you know what, uh, feel free to disagree. I am willing to give this book a chance, unlike a lot of people. Like, it's, I'm so sick and tired of seeing people whining and crying about the loss of Krakow. It's like, dude, look, you knew this was coming the second that that House of X book was first put out. And if you didn't, God bless you. If you didn't see all the solicits for the fall of X like over a year ago, and you still sat up here and thought, oh yeah, no, Krakow is gonna be forever. I don't know what to tell you, uh, but I can definitely tell you it ain't gonna be here in this book. You guessed it, obligatory channel outro time. If you're not subscribed to the channel, consider doing so. Clicking that subscribe button and tapping that notification bell ensures that you get more videos just like this one and you don't miss any of my other content that I drop throughout the week, plus my live streams every Thursday and Saturday. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure you click that like button, keep it plus ultra, and sound off in the comments.